Hey, Debbie, it's great to see you. It's been a while. It has. Good to be back. So what do you have for us today? So today we're going to talk, this is part two of what we discussed the last time we met, and that is talking about the disconnection that occurs when a couple is working recovery. And today we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about what happens with the addict partner and their shame and how that creates the disconnection. We're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about how do we create connection because that's the ultimate goal. As a reminder, through the pro-dependence lens, we are looking at the addiction from the standpoint of it being a disruption in the connection between the couple that not only the addict partner, but the betrayed partner are experiencing. And so the goal, the ultimate goal is to not only recover from our addiction and our betrayal trauma, but it's also to work on healing the attachments, the attachment wounds, and anything like that that is standing in the way of the couple feeling completely connected. So as a reminder from the last webinar, I talked about how it shows up in my sessions. Oftentimes it's um, the betrayed partner coming in and reporting that because she's felt unsafe, she's gone into some safety seeking. One of the safety seeking things that she does is she goes to the addict partner and she will ask him or her what they're doing for the recovery. They want to know what can you do to make me feel safe right now. I had someone say this last week that she starts asking a lot of questions when this happens. Um, somebody else reports that they go in and they are kind of critical of how they see their partner doing. They just want to make sure they're safe. What that does, though, is it causes the addict partner to go into their shame. And so the betrayed partners come in reporting that they're getting resistance, that their partners are defensive. They're told to stay in their own lane. They're reminded as the betrayed partner that they're not supporting the addict partner in recovery. And the couple then goes into their stories. So now we're caught in our stories. So for the betrayed partner, the story is he's not safe. I'm never going to be able to trust him. He must not be in recovery because he's not willing to do this for me. The addict partner is thinking to him or herself, I'm not supported. I'm never getting any credit. I'll never get it right. I'm not even sure I have the ability to finally get to a place where I'm never going to be blamed. And so on and on, they're caught in their stories. So this is the cycle of disconnection that they get caught in. So what causes the addict partner to disconnect? I've already made reference to that a bit, and that is shame. And when we experience shame, there's three different types of feelings that occur. So let's just start, first of all, with how Brene Brown defines shame, because I love how she defines it. And just notice how it really is through those lenses of attachment. She defines shame as a toxic, excruciating feeling that occurs when something or someone makes us feel like we're defective and unworthy of love and connection. So when we believe we're being labeled with an identity that we don't like and we don't want to be associated with, then our shame gets triggered. Most of us want to be seen as really good individuals, worthy and valued. For the addict partner, shame might come up when they feel like they're not being seen as putting in the hard work. Maybe their partner suggests that they need to spend more time or criticizes them. And so as a result, they experience fear, blame, and disconnection, like I said. So let's talk about the fear that comes up with shame. So again, like I said, fear is a result of that association with an unwanted identity. And we disdain that. We don't want people to see us in a negative light. And as a result of that person that's supposed to love us and care for us, seeing us in such a negative light, we start to feel unworthy of love and connection. So as the betrayed partner is triggering the addict partner, the addict partner will go into their fear. And they start to believe in, in their stories that they're a lesser person. And that's where their shame takes them. So oftentimes, the brain, remember, is no longer connected to prefrontal. We're not grounded. We're in limbic. We're flooded with emotions. And that fear takes us into anger. When there's anger, then they move into blame. So this negative emotion of anger gets shifted 
onto blame for the betrayed partner. So they direct it towards the betrayed partner because they feel like they're being unjustly labeled and they don't deserve to be labeled that way. So if the betrayed partner makes the addict partner feel inadequate, they escape the shame by getting angry and blaming the betrayed partner for being so critical, so ungrateful, for being crazy. And they'll say things like, you never recognize all the good that I'm doing. You know, you're the most critical person I know. You need to get on your own side of the street. You're not working your recovery. You're worse off than I am. I actually had somebody come in and report that recently that they were told that. So we can turn the blame outward. So the betrayed partner can feel the addict partner blaming them. And it feels like gaslighting to them. We can also take and turn the blame inward. So the addict partner can start to blame themselves. So they start blaming themselves for being so defective and that they are ultimately deserving of this shameful experience. So they go into their own negative internal dialogue. They've got this really negative self-talk. They're putting themselves down. That leads to self-hatred, to self-pity. And I even see the addict partners taking you know, and not setting boundaries around things that they should. So they will take on, or they will allow rather, the betrayed partner to get angry, to have rage, to even be abusive. And they feel like they deserve it because they've turned, you know, that shame inward and that they blame themselves for the situation that they're in. So the unfortunate part about blame is that it's so unproductive because it expels the negative feelings without really addressing the root cause of the shame. And if we don't address the root cause of the shame, then we can't make the change. So it's very, very distractive. Now, as a result of all of that, disconnection is going to occur. So that's the third piece of what happens with the addict partner. So not only do we disconnect from others, but we also disconnect from ourselves. And then we allow all of this to control our thoughts and our feelings and our behaviors. So, right, when the addict partner goes into their fear, they become angry, they go into blame, oftentimes they will disconnect from their betrayed partner because the shame is so overwhelming. So this looks like the addict partner avoiding, not talking, um, maybe talking in very short you know, answers. And so the betrayed partner starts to notice this. They feel the sense of that disconnection that occurs. Um, <clears throat> so they also can, we can also unintentionally disconnect. Um, I talked this last week with a group about how important it is to recognize your own shame. With shame, we need to know that we feel it in our body. We need to identify in our shame, what is the negative self-talk I go into? What do I start to tell myself? Is it that I'm never going to get it right? You know, I'm the worst person alive. Is it I'm not good enough? Is it I'm broken? We need to recognize our own personalized shame messages. That's so important. And then we need to understand how our shame shows up. What is my partner going to see when I'm in my shame? It mirrors a fight, flight, or freeze response. So if I'm in fight, I'm going to get defensive. If I'm in flight, I'm going to pull away and avoid and leave. And if I'm in freeze, I'm going to shut down. When we're in fight, flight, or freeze, there's automatic disconnection. So it's really important to recognize for both the betrayed partner and the addict partner when shame comes in and creates the disconnection. So how can the betrayed partner and the addict partner recognize when disconnection is occurring? First of all, I noticed that um, oftentimes it's a sense that the betrayed partner feels. They might just notice, like I mentioned before, that the addict partner isn't talking as much or they just sense the behaviors are different. They might notice that the addict partner is pulling away. Um, visually, they will see that. They will notice that they are not talking. 
And so what's going to happen is the betrayed partner is going to start going into their safety seeking. We talked quite a bit about safety seeking in part one. And as they're in their safety seeking, they become very persistent in their efforts to make sure that everything's safe and secure so they can connect. This can lead to the addict partner feeling very frustrated as they're watching the betrayed partner going into the safety seeking. So then they go into blame. So again, there's blame there. Um, like I mentioned, both the addict partner and the betrayed partner can experience fear. So if you're in your fear, if you're in your shame, if you're experiencing anger, you need to recognize that disconnection is occurring. In extreme cases, I see couples, both the betrayed partner and the addict partner, threatening to totally leave the relationship. And so when they're feeling extremely disconnected, oftentimes, now we put boundaries in place around that and we have fair fighting rules. So it's really important that you take into consideration that at times when we're talking about really hard things and we know that we're prone to disconnection, that we put plans in place. With that, we have the fair fighting rules. So we work on putting together a contract as to how we're going to communicate together, how we're gonna work through those moments when we're in our shame. And so we'll talk a little bit um, as I go through some ideas on how to create connection, what that would look like. So let's talk about some different things um, that we can do. So what is needed for safe connection is simply commitment. That's the bottom line that is so foundational to everything. So first and foremost, the couple needs to have a committed, intentional plan for working on the relationship from the very beginning. So in those early days, that needs to be verbalized and a plan, plan needs to be put into action. So along the way, the couple also needs to verbalize their commitment to healing the attachment and repairing the relationship as well. So the first step is to keep in mind that you both want to heal, that you both want to restore the relationship in spite of your addiction, in spite of your betrayal trauma. So it's really important that this plan includes a qualified therapist who can give you the guidance. How we approach it where I work is we bring the couple in together for a short while to have some psychoeducation about addiction, about betrayal trauma through the pro-dependence lens. And then they separate and start working on their own particular recovery, whether it's from addiction or it's from betrayal. So for a short while, it feels like they're walking separate paths and separate journeys. And for the betrayed partner, it's to help them regulate, to help them understand the effects of the betrayal trauma on them, to get some more education and some tools to use, because this is so difficult, especially when we're trying to go back in with the addict partner that's created this betrayal trauma to start to do the repair. We have to have certain skills and tools. Along the way, we also need to make sure that if a therapeutic disclosure is needed, that that's done. That's really important to repairing the connection. It's a scary process. We've talked about that in detail in the past. But if the betrayed partner needs to have a therapeutic disclosure, it needs to happen. Then a plan needs to be put into place as to when you're going to start couples therapy. Our recommendation is that you get a little bit of recovery under your belt and then you start come back together. Typically it's after you do that formal therapeutic disclosure. So you can start to work through some of that. Now, along the way, you're also seeing your individual therapist to work on your own things. So typically once therapeutic disclosure is done and I see it happening usually around four to six months into recovery work. And then at that point, we're gonna bring you together and start working on the repair. So it's really important to have a very specific plan put into place. Secondly, what needs to happen is each person has to be willing and committed in putting the needs of the relationship in the forefront of everything. So they've got to really commit to the relationship. This means that the relationship takes priority over work, over friends, over family, over children at times, most of the time actually. Secondly, the relationship takes priority over being right. The relationship takes priority over your own comfort. 
So we're always prioritizing the fact we're trying to repair the relationship. We have to be really regulated to be able to do that. Okay, next point. The addict partner and the betrayed partner are committed to taking actions and in doing their own recovery with the attitude and with the goal that it's going to assist them in creating a healthier connection and a healthier relationship. So not only are we doing our recovery for ourselves, but we're also looking at it as the ways, the way to creating a healthier connection as a partnership. So that's very, very important. It's important that both show up and are committed to being authentic. That's very difficult when there's a lot of shame. So when I'm authentic, I share with you how I'm feeling in the moment, even though it may be difficult for the other person to hear how I'm feeling. We'll talk about communication in a moment because there's ways we communicate that will you know, assist us in maintaining connection and creating connection. Um, the addict partner along the way needs to be committed to showing remorse and taking accountability. That's very important. It's not just a one-time thing that along the way, as the betrayed partner needs it, and even when they don't ask for it, the addict partner is really showing genuine remorse, that they feel sorry for the pain that the betrayed partner is experiencing, that they recognize the impact of their actions on their partner. That's so important and it creates so much safety for the betrayed partner. At times, both need to be committed to giving each other the space that you need for healing. And this is really hard sometimes because when one person says, hey, I need to take a time out to regroup, the other partner might see that as disconnection from me and their anxiety goes up. But in reality, Allowing somebody to step out to regroup in a timeout really is healthy for the relationship because we're stepping out because we're typically limbic and we're going to say or do something that is going to cause, you know, the relationship to feel even more disconnected. It'll do more damage. Um, also, the goal in giving each other space is there are times when we're in conflict, when we're in drama, and we need to have the goal of getting out of that to be number one. And oftentimes that means we've got to take a time out. We've got to create space and go feel safe again and do whatever we need to do. Um, along the way, the addict partner also needs to commit to, um, to really reassuring the betrayed partner. So let's talk a little bit about the safety seeking. You know, safety seeking happens and often, oftentimes the addict partner doesn't recognize that it is safety seeking. And so typically, what you'll see in the betrayed partner is they're doing some crazy behaviors at times. It might be that they're sneaking around, they're looking in bank accounts, they're checking emails, they're getting angry, their, um, their moods are changing all over the place because they're not sure what they need. Um, they may be critical, like I talked about. When you see those types of behaviors, if you can look at it through the lenses of my partner needs safety in this moment, she or he needs reassurance. I need to reassure them, you know, that I've been totally honest. I need to reassure them that I'm committed to the relationship. I need to reassure them that I am committed to changing my behaviors. That's so important. You will see the betrayed partners just regulation, you know, just totally shift and change. They'll become much more regulated. Both need to be committed to being completely open, honest, and direct in their communication. So that means no little white lies. Even the betrayed partner can have little white lies. So it's really important even on the small things that you're very open and honest. There's no secret keeping. That's really important. So that might be something if it's been a pattern in your relationship that when you get into couples, you really work on that. You work on that ability to show up authentically and openly and honestly. That's hard for the addict at times. That's why they have an addiction. So it's really important that we learn to reach out and talk honestly and openly about what we're experiencing internally. Um, it might look like if the addict partner has a slip, then they share it within 12 to 24 hours with an understanding of this is what led to it. This is what I'm doing now. This is what I'm going to do to prevent it in the future. So give information as an addict partner to your betrayed partner so that they feel safe and secure. 
both the addict partner and the betrayed partner need to be really congruent and consistent in their word and their actions. So if the addict partner commits to going to therapy or their support groups on a consistent basis, they do it without being pushed, without being um, you know, threatened, they do it. For the betrayed partner, they'll commit to not doing unhealthy safety seeking and then they do it. That's a congruency. Both need to see that. It shows that you're committed to creating connection. Um, both are working on staying grounded and not reactive. You're gonna react. In the earlier days, more reactions take place than later on. We're hoping that you respond because by that time, you've got your skills and your tools. You're calling the timeouts. You're both committed to being vulnerable. Now, this is a hard one, and this is going to be something you work on, you know, as you're well into recovery, because at some point I have to share my hurts, my concerns. I've got to be open and honest. And there is risk when we're vulnerable. And the risk is you might pull away from me and you might disconnect. But in reality, when we can sit in vulnerability together, it creates deeper connection. So the real goal is I've got to start being vulnerable. I've got to start sharing more about what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling and doing that along the way. Um, both need to be willing to try and understand each other. So this is where empathy comes in. I'm really trying to look at if I am an addict partner as a safety seeking, as a need for my partner to feel safe and secure so she or he can move towards me. Um, I need to be able to maybe look at my addict partner as this is really hard work and they're trying to rewire their brain and we've got to create new neural pathways. So, you know what, I can understand why he doesn't move as fast in his recovery as I do because I'm not rewiring my brain. And when he expresses how hard it is, then I have the ability with empathy to go in and say, you know, I know, I can imagine it is so hard. And I realize that you're working and that it takes time. It creates so much connection when we do that, when we try to understand each other. When I'm willing to step into your shoes for a moment, I don't have to agree with you, but I'm trying to look at it the way you might be looking at it and understand it the way you do. Um, we need to be really committed to having a lot of respect. So that means that we don't use shame-based language, that there's no name calling, that you're really listening instead for not the content, of what your partner's saying, but more the feelings that they're having and focusing on that. Both really need to be committed to speaking and listening and communicating with compassion and kindness. So I teach couples and I teach betrayed partners the talking boundary that I've gone over numerous times. And it's so simple. It's that we are expressing what's going on internally for me so what that sounds like is it sounds like, first of all, I share the data, what I see you do or what I'm hearing you say. And then secondly, we're going to share the stories I'm telling myself. So I'm now telling you my stories I'm in right now. And then thirdly, I share the emotions that that brings up for me when I see or hear you do that. And then I combine it with my story. The fourth part of that talking boundary is, here's what I need moving forward. Or it might be a boundary. Here's the safety boundary I need to put into place so that we can stay connected. Stephanie Carnes also uses the acronym SUPPORT. And I like that too, because we can kind of use the S-U-P-P-O-R-T. So the S stands for, I'm gonna stop and give my partner some undivided attention because I know that this conversation is very important to him or her. The next one is understanding. I'm going to try to understand where my partner's coming from. If we're coming from betrayal or we're coming from a place of addiction that was brought on by other traumas um, or abandonment wounding, I'm trying to look at my partner through those lenses. I'm going to, the P next one is to provide empathy. So again, I'm focusing on the feelings. So as I hear their feeling words, I try to relate to that feeling word because we've all experienced the same emotions. And so that's what I'm going to identify. I'm not going to go to what they said. I'm going to go to what they're feeling. Then I'm going to provide validation. So it would be something like, you know, I understand how you would feel that way, or that makes sense that you would feel that way. You know, I can relate to that. The next one is openness. 
So we've got to be open and honest, even if there's questions and they're hard questions to answer. You are completely open. Then, like I said, there needs to be remorse. So with the addict partner, it's about all those behaviors that your addiction had you doing that has created the betrayal trauma in your partner. For the betrayed partner, it might be times that you make mistakes in your recovery because we all make mistakes and we need to take accountability. And so there's going to be times that we feel badly about what we've done and we need to express the fact that we're sorry and that we feel very remorseful about our behaviors and that we're working on our addiction, our recovery, or we're working on our um, trauma responses so that we're not creating further disconnection. And then the last one is touch. You can provide physical comfort if your partner's open to it. I oftentimes, when my, my couples are in a place where they are able to um, touch and have connection, sometimes when we're having difficult conversations, I'll have them hold hands or physically touch each other because it helps them to co-regulate their emotions. But the last thing all in all is both partners need to be committed to compromising and negotiating those things that are negotiable. So along the way, everything is not black and white. Some things are, other things aren't. It's really important that you know the difference. It's important that you recognize that you're not always gonna get your own way, that there is gonna be compromise at times, and there's gonna be times where you're gonna be willing to give in to your partner's needs rather than meet your own. That flexibility is very, very important. And that commit to, to being flexible is so important in maintaining that connection. So anyway, that's a lot of stuff I've shared in creating commitment. Just recognize the fact that we're learning a little bit at a time, a little bit here and a little bit there. And pretty soon over the course of your recovery, you're going to see that these things come naturally and you're going to see the connection deepen. Great information. And so I, and I really appreciate it. I was thinking even when you committed to compromise and uh, negotiating, you know, you talked earlier about um, uh, putting the relationship first. And, and I often share Dr. Stan Tatkin did a podcast with Dr. Rob on we do and it, and for those that put the relationship first, you know, and if you keep that, then both people are happier and healthier. It's a healthy relationship. You're much better off pair bonded. If that isn't the case, then it's unhealthy and you, I mean, literally, physically, emotionally, everything, you're better off not together. So, so what you're talking about is how do we navigate all of this and find connection. I had a question for you um, when you were talking about, you know, the um, the fair fighting, like you have a fair fighting contract. Mm -hmm. How hard is it uh, for couples to uh, to define it for how they're going to do and then to honor it? Like I, because I can imagine, like the first few times at least you go right back to the same pattern so how do you hold the space and go wait 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 we agreed to this yes so how it typically is presented and approached in the program we run is those that are working on their healing their betrayal trauma we have an exercise on that and so we talk about the things that are needed to create safety when we're having a disagreement and so some of the things will be like no shame-based language, no swearing. Um, and so they get lots of ideas. So I'll give you some. Um, some of them would be, we don't fight in the bedroom. I have one couple, they go out to the garage. So they're not in the bedroom and they don't fight in front of the children. Um, obviously there's not gonna be, there's no rage. There's no throwing things. Um, there's, I'm trying to think of some of the others that we are willing to, when the partner calls a timeout, we honor it. Okay. Sometimes we don't want to because we're limbic and we're fighting mm -hmm. for connection in that moment. Um, I'm trying to think there's, they're so creative. It's just amazing to me what the betrayed partners come up with regarding their fair fighting rules. And we always add to it. In fact, we talked about fair fighting in one of my groups this week and in group, you know, um, the betrayed partner identified another rule she needed to go back and add. So once this is put together, they share it in group and they get feedback on it. And then the next step is the betrayed partner presents it to the addict partner. So they sit down during a check-in when they're both really regulated and they go over the rules. Now the addict partner is also allowed to contribute to that. It's not just the betrayed partner. Sometimes they'll sign on it. 
right? And they go, this is a contract. We're going to sign on it. I encourage them to have your fair fighting rules in front of you when you're having a hard discussion so that you can refer to them. And if at any point, you know, you go limbic, it's going sideways, then you stop, you take a break and you review your fair fighting rules. Typically, I tell the clients, you know what, you, you need at least, I know they say 20 minutes, 30 minutes to get back online, to get your brain back on track, right? When it's, you know, off track and offline and you're limbic. I think it takes longer for a couple, especially in the early stages of recovery. And so oftentimes I'll tell them, can you come back in a few hours? Can you do it if it's at night, it's the next morning? Oftentimes in their um, fair fighting contracts, they will also put that there's no heavy discussions after 10 p.m. or 9 p.m. Um, another idea is that they're well fed, right? I don't go in if I'm hungry to have a hard discussion. I don't go in if I'm tired. That's another one. Um, so all those little things that you can think of that sets you up. Um, I'm not going to blame um, the other person. I'm going to use eye language. So those are all some ideas for the fair fighting. And it does take work, but it's so important that you, we understand what is allowed when we're having the hard discussion. And I think there's a, like, I guess I was thinking, you, you know, you're talking about having a set, like, I know I'm going to have a difficult discussion. Like, I understand that versus something comes up and I get triggered and we start fighting, you know, so, mm -hmm. so. But like I just think catching yourself in the moment, you know, it will take practice. And so each of you being aware and giving each, you know, giving space and all of that and just going, okay, you know, need to take a break or whatever, you know, it's really important. Again, with the goal of, you know, I love that you said we both have a commitment to, you know, to, you know, working towards the, the relationship, um, you know, the, the safety and honesty, not just look what I'm doing, you know, doing all the work, you know, which is mm -hmm. dismissive, you know, of a partner. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was important when you said, you know, both congruent and words and actions, um, you know, commit to, to not having unhealthy safety seeking. And I thought, I bet it takes some practice for a partner to work on what is healthy safety seeking versus what is, you know, not productive and not healthy, you know, because everything feels like I need to know, you know, so early on because it's, you know, such an upheaval and such a betrayal. Um, I did want to comment too, because at one point you talked about, you know, the betrayed partner, you know, triggered um, the addict and made them feel. And I struggle with that from the standpoint of like, I, I think a trigger can, um, you know, the, the result can be that an addict feels, but I really feel like, you know, I am responsible, you know, for my feelings. So, so, and I, you know, it's, I don't think an, a betrayed partner can trigger an addict to go act out, you know, it's not an excuse. And I think our actions and words have, um, results but but you know how we take them in you know um we we can be empowered to to frame that does that make sense it does i think that awareness is really important i know in the early stages that they do assign blame like that to their partner you triggered me into this you, you yes know. and and so part of their healing work and the recovery work they need to do is recognizing that awareness that my partner doesn't make me you know, feel or do anything. That's right. me. And you're mm -hmm. right. But when they're caught in this cycle of disconnection, man, the blame is going back and forth, you know, and that's one mm -hmm. of the first things I really start working on, not only the regulation, you know, of the betrayed partner, but how can we start to create connection, you know, with your addict partner? And we start small and we try to go in and have success and then we rebuild. And part of that is that awareness, right? You yeah. Have yeah. To choose. It's, it, it is not about them. It's about your choice. I love that you used along the way, you use that multiple times. That's a great reminder that this is a journey, you know, that, you know, it's not like, you know, running a race and then you get done. It's, you know, there's, there's still, it's the journey and you use that multiple times about, you know, commitments and, you know, having the discussion of things. You mentioned psychoeducation and, not everybody has the benefit of being able to come to Family Strategies in Mesa, Arizona. The, the online work groups that we offer, you know, they're online um, and, and they provide exactly that. They're not 
uh, treatment or therapy, but it is the psychoeducation that is the components that help you bring information to your therapist, you know, that you, you know, you can have new, um, new awarenesses and um, glean new information and then bring that to the therapist to help process mm -hmm. through. So, so please consider those online uh, work groups. Um, and then there's, some, oh, the secret keeping. I thought, you know, the secret keeping, I have heard from both people, you know, both sides of this. I don't want to tell him or her because it will trigger them. And so, you know, my first thought was secret keeping is, like I'm holding something back because I don't want to cause a problem, you know? So when you're talking about, we have to be willing to be in that vulnerable space, even if we, you know, even if we start with, I have something difficult to share with you, or you're asking me how I'm feeling. Well, you know, I, I, I would like to share this with you. I'm, you know, this may be a little uncomfortable for both of us, but, you know, I'm going to be willing to, to just try, you know, um, because otherwise it's always that gap in the relationship that we're not really being authentic and in a real relationship because we're still holding back. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I know that I run into this with betrayed partners because they might be spending a lot of money and, and mm. the other partner's not aware of that. Or, you know, they, uh, I've had them even go get jobs and not tell their partner they're going out and getting a job. And, you know, there's a lot of those kind of little secrets that even the betrayed partner, obviously, you know, they don't want their addict partner doing that. So we really talk about that, right? And that is you expect this from your, you know, your addict partner. That means you've got to also you know, show up with complete honesty, no little lies. And that even includes if they ask you, hey, are you okay? And you go, yeah, I'm fine. And you're not fine. That's a little white lie. Mm -hmm. We have to say, no, right now, there's a lot going on for me internally. I'm not sure what it is. When I figure it out, I'll come to you and share that. But that's what's going on with me right now. That's being open, authentic, and honest. Yeah. And I love that you talked to you about, you know, identifying how shame shows up for you and, you know, however that is, you know, body reactions and, you know, the, the pulling away, what, whatever it is. And I think, um, you know, I, I think recovery, you know, this whole journey is, is about becoming more intentional, more aware of, of who and what we are. But when, you know, like, you know, I hold stress in my gut, you know, and so as soon as my gut is all clenched up, I'm going, oh, I, you know, like, it's like, oh, I need to kind of pay attention to this, you know, and what's going on. And then I can, you know, kind of process through it. But, but just being aware of, you know, all of those aspects, you know, um, can be challenging, because we're so especially with addicts, we're so compartmentalized. But I think even partners, like, they've had to shut down in so many different ways that they may not be really aware you know, of how much, you know, has been impacting them. And they even minimize, I find that a lot with the partners too. I mean, both the, the addict does that too, but I do see even the betrayed partners will minimize things, right? Because like you said, it's kind of a form of compartmentalization. It's just so overwhelming or it could be pattern. And, and so I have to really get in touch with what's going on, what's really going on. So we have a question. My SA keeps falling asleep during recovery videos. He says he's not, but he snores and is obviously sleeping. I've offered suggestions on how to counteract this, but he refuses to even admit he's sleeping. Does he just not care? Is he in denial? What's going on? How do I show him how hurtful this is? Well, first of all, I just really want to, I can imagine how frustrating that, that is. And even like you said, very hurtful. The fact that you really want him to be in recovery with you and you you want him to be as invested in it, I imagine, as you are at that point. Um, I'm not sure what's going on with him and that would take some more exploration. What I would do is I would use my talking boundary format and I want you to sit with that and I want you to journal using that talking boundary format. So it'd be when we're watching videos, I notice your snore, I hear you snore. I see your eyes closed. Here's the stories I'm telling myself. And just share all the stories that are going on for you and how that makes you feel. And then you're going to follow that up with, here's what I need. Or, and it might be, I need you to figure out, you know, is there resistance to watching this? I'm not sure you didn't say how committed he is to his own recovery, because it could be there's that, he's still in that denial and when there's denial, there's a lot of resistance. And so maybe he hasn't broken through that denial yet. Um, I don't know. 
I would even have him go ahead a physical exam and see, is there some underlying, you know, physical issues going on for him? Um, is it that you're doing it late at night? Because I know I go busy during the day. And if I sit down at night and start to watch something and it takes a lot of brain power, sometimes my brain shuts off and I go to sleep as well. So there's a lot of little factors. So go inward, kind of check in and see what's that like for you, what's your internal experience. Sit down with your, you know, your partner when they're fully awake, well fed, you know, and you can sit down and kind of share this and sit and explore. Just, just be curious. I tell the betrayed partners, if you can go in with curiosity rather than accusations, you know, help me understand why you're falling asleep. What's your awareness about why you're falling asleep? Because the story I'm telling myself is that you don't really care. And that our marriage or our relationship isn't that important to you. And that makes me really sad. So help me, help me out here. So when we do that, then we're inviting our partner to share their experience. If he says, oh, I don't know, then I usually follow that up with, well, will you think on that? And let's get together at the same time tomorrow night. And let's go over this again. And then commit to, both of you need to commit verbally to where you're going to meet and what time you're going to meet and go through it again. Maybe you might need to, if you're finding that there's a lot of resistance, I'm not sure if you're in therapy in your own individual therapy, maybe you want to step into a couple session and see if you can work through in a few couple sessions, you know, how to get you both on the same page. We often do that in the early days of recovery with partners. If I'm finding that they're, they've got a sticking point, I call it, and we just can't get beyond that, oftentimes they'll either go in and meet as a couple with either the betrayed partner's therapist or the addict partner's therapist before they've identified their couple's therapist. And we'll just work on situations just like you're talking about. So get some help too, so you're not the only one trying to deal with this. I, and I feel for you because, you know, it, it, it sounds like I... What I make up in my, you know, the story I'm telling myself is that you've said, let's sit in a different chair so that you're not in the recliner leaning back. I mean, you've given practical solutions. Let's not do it at, you know, nine o'clock at night, I mean, whatever. Um, but you're getting confronted with, no, I'm not, no, I'm not, no, I'm not. Um, you know, so, so that is, you know, that is really challenging um, to, because uh, uh, all of the things that you're saying, Debbie, are very practical but if the addict is still going, no, I'm not, no, I'm not, no, I'm not. I mean, it's flat out denial of something that you are experiencing as completely your reality. So, and sometimes but. I see that denial really come up, um, you know, the addict partner towards the betrayed partner. And when you get a therapist in there that they trust, that the therapist can say things that, you know, the person cannot hear from their partner. And sometimes that's one way to break through the denial you know, we've even had situations where we bring both therapists and the couple in together to work through a difficult issue. So you're right. Okay, the next question. It sounds like a perfect world of couples work on an equal playing field. How can this work when the essay holds resentment, defiant, is a bully, yet says he wants the marriage, refuses a men's letter, no softened heart, and holds my boundaries against me. Separated three years because of his lying and continuous relapses. How can there be any couples work with an essay like he's in 12-step therapy yet no remorse, no empathy, little recovery, relationally exhaustive? Wow. Yeah, I'm exhausted just hearing the question. And that is that is such a difficult thing that you've, you're up against because there's so many things going on there. I'm not sure. It sounds like he's been in recovery work. If you guys have been separated for three years, I'm not sure if you've done you know, recovery work that whole time, but you're dealing with some very difficult issues there. So you're right. There cannot be a level playing field. It is not ideal because the bottom line is that both parties need to be committed, like I said, and willing to work on it for whatever reason. For you, I'm so proud of you for having boundaries because that is the number one thing you're going to need for safety. And oftentimes boundaries, if we're really good at our boundaries and we're holding them accountable with those boundaries, sometimes that will assist in getting the addict partner to kind of make some shifts and some changes 
there could be something else going on. I don't know what kind of trauma your um, addict partner has had. Sometimes trauma shows up, you know, with the bullying and being very defensive defiant. Um, and so for you, I think it's get the support you need and get, you know, work on your healing recovery. You may not ever get an amends letter. You may not, he may not ever step out of being a bully, but what can you do in your healing recovery? So you're going to be okay regardless. Oftentimes I have to take women through that exercise and we have to talk about that because there are some sex addicts that just aren't willing to do all of the work necessary to get to the point where you can be on an equal playing field and start working on couples therapy. That's, that's just the reality of addiction. And especially when you've got an addict who's not willing to fully commit to their recovery so that they can repair the relationship. Yeah. And uh, I, I always think it's, well, I, I honor you for having your boundaries. I, you know, a hundred percent. Um, um, but I think it's sad when, you know, three years and, you know, still separated. So you're in a relationship, but you're not, you know? And so, so I often encourage partners to look at, you know, like this is February. So at the end of this year, if this is still going on, I mean, and again, zero judgment, it's just like visualizing, am I okay if at the end of the year, this is still going on or what do I need to do to take care of me? Whatever that is, um, uh, you know, but it feels like you're in, um, you know, that holding pattern of, you know, he's, he, he's not, he may be abstinent, but he is not in recovery. I mean, he's, you know, he may not be acting out with those behaviors, but, you know, he's got, you know, like you said, no remorse. He's not willing to do the work. He's, you know, manipulating and using, you know, your boundaries against you. So, um, you know, so, so you've got, so we use the analogy, I've shared this before too, like in, you know, with the drinking, you know, there's people who stop drinking and then they're dry drunk. They're just nasty, not nice people because all that was removed was the alcohol and every mm -hmm. other character defect. And that's what we call it in 12 steps. So, you know, um, you know, but every other character defect is still there. So the recovery journey, and like I said, you know, Debbie used along the way, you know, that, that we're working on becoming better people. We're working on gaining the skills that we lack you know, because, because, you know, we've been using a problematic behavior as a maladaptive coping mechanism, you know, so, so we learn the skills and the tools, but it's baby steps for us, you partners, you know, I hear all the time from partners, I would never do that. Of course, you would never do that. You are, your brain is functioning and you, you think of the relationship and you think of the family and what all this, and addicts are just going, I need to escape. I need to numb out and, and so compartmentalized. And it's not an excuse. It really isn't. There's a podcast that's going to drop next week. Dr. Rob recorded on the neurobiology of addiction. I can't wait to hear it. Um, he said, this woman is brilliant. And so I'm, you know, that will be on. Um, so, so check it out by next Thursday, they typically drop. So I, but we'll post um, some information about it, but I think just having that lens of, you know, what, you know, what the challenges are, it, again, it's not an excuse, but this is what we have to overcome. And, you know, for those that are willing to do the work, you know, it's, it's, you know, it is a journey and it is so worth it for someone like that. I, I feel sad for you. I feel equally as sad for him because, you know, what a miserable way to live, you know, being a bully and, you know, a not nice person. Um, so can I uh, add so a little sorry. bit? To what you're please, saying? please. Along yeah. with the neurobiology, obviously there is a lot of shame there and shame is so different for the addict versus the betrayed partner. I'm here to tell you that right now for the betrayed partner. Um, it, 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 it is not, it is not the cause of their betrayal. Shame contributes to their addiction. And so shame is something that the addict has to really work through. And so where I work, we do a lot of stuff with Brene Brown. They do a lot of processing and group on getting to the root of that. And it does take work. It's hard, scary work for the addict partner. And so it's easy. I mean, I think we can get stuck in our shame and not want to work on it because it doesn't feel good. It's really painful. And remember, addicts are in their addiction because they don't know how to manage pain. And I'm not talking just physical pain. I'm talking emotional pain. I'm talking shame. And so definitely you're still dealing with that shame. And 
I don't need that you can comprehend it because you haven't experienced it the same. It's it's just different. And I wish I could put words to it. Okay, next question is, when I try to express my feelings, my essay puts his head down and says he feels shame. I feel it is a way to shut me down. Um, I think this is a continuation. He was diagnosed with antisocial personal uh, personality disorder, avoidant personality disorder. My heart is sad because I see how broken he is. Yeah. And the reality is when you have that type of a diagnosis, um, the it, it is it is one of those things that is not easily overcome. First of all, when we do have a personality disorder, lots of times those that have that, it's a result of things that have happened early on in their lives. And those people don't have a tendency to stay in therapy and really do the deep work they need to do. So for you, it might be just coming to terms with owning your own reality. And that is one of the steps that I will take betrayed partners through as well. And just looking at your reality and then look at the pros and the cons. I mean, what are the pluses? What are the minuses of staying in the relationship? You might have reasons to stay in the relationship that are very, very valid for where you're at right now in your life. And there's no judgment there. And so then what can you do with the help of your therapist to kind of identify how you can stay in that type of relationship? And you can somehow still thrive. You're going to have to have lots of boundaries. So it would take a lot of boundary work. Um, it would take even grieving the loss of the fact that this person doesn't have the capacity or the willingness to do recovery. So you're going to have to do some of that work as well. And to get to a place where you can reach out to other people to get your needs met, because obviously your addict partner doesn't have the capacity or the willingness to meet those needs. And so there is a way to do that. Is it hard? Yes, it is. Is it possible? Yes, it is. But it does take work. Oh, oh. So the okay. So it was the so second part was different. not for me. Okay, then my my answer is completely different. Um, <laughs> because because yeah, I mean, I hear this regularly. Um, we have guys that come to our treatment program that mm -hmm. that talk about yeah, they use uh, they you know oh yeah I, you. It's like you're making me feel shame, and uh, so therefore it shuts a partner down. So, uh, you know, there have been lots of things that are. So it's like, okay, you know, you feel shame. So what are you, what are you going to do about that? You know, Troy loves finding peace is the shadows of shame. You know, um, Debbie just mentioned. Um, so we've answered two different questions, kind of in, <laughs> but but in, with in the, interval, you know, we? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so Debbie did a great two part series on you know, on the process of grieving. And so um, those webinars are posted on the Seeking Integrity site. So please visit that. Um, but, you know, as for, I, I mean, to me, it's like, I, I, I'm sorry, you go to your shame. That doesn't negate my feelings. So, you know, Eddie Caparucci is also done um, I, I, I won't say it right, but, um, it's basically, you have to learn to tolerate the feelings of a, a partner. So what do you need to do as the addict to tolerate, you know, those uncomfortable, that's what, that's what recovery is all about is we learn to do things that we didn't do well before. So, so, so taking the personality issues out, then, um, then if there isn't personality um, uh, diagnoses in there, then yeah, it's that it, 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 the story I'm telling myself, you know, when you shut me down by using your shame is you are just pushing me away, not stepping into the relationship. So, and you you validate also, your feelings. Yeah. yeah, but you can also even ask your partner who's putting his head down in shame to share with you, what's the story you're telling yourself right now? I'm just curious, you know? Mm. Because that's another way to maybe get him to start to identify what's going on internally for him. It sounds to me like, I remember I said, when we're in our shame, we go fight, flight, freeze. So that's, that's a possibility. Um, ask him if he's willing to listen to any of the Brene Brown stuff. I love the power of vulnerability. Um, that's just on the audiobook. You can listen to that. It's very, very easy. Just to kind of start to get an understanding of shame. Um, she's got several books on that. And... So that's one way just to kind of start to get your, your partner to share what's going on. And I, I personally went to Troy Love's um, retreat on finding peace. And that is, you know, talking about the various wounds and um, the shadows of shame. And so for someone who is in recovery, 
Um, it, I would not recommend it for somebody very early in discovery because I think it would be triggering either for a partner or for an addict. But man, you know, like I, I've been doing this a while and there was still, it took me a couple of weeks to kind of percolate through things. I was too busy. I should have taken more time, but, um, but, but man, the, the awarenesses, like I already could identify some of my um, some of those wounds and things, a couple of them though popped up and I was like, Oh, I didn't know that one was even part of it. So, so like the ability to just identify, you know, um, some things was really useful for me, you know, so I, it wouldn't be, Oh, I feel shame. I'd be like, Oh, that's my, you know, whatever wound getting poked. And I'm, you know, I can choose to show up differently. I don't have to, you know, shrink into myself and, and, and distance myself from my partner who is trying to be vulnerable and connected to me. So just a thought. Yeah. Okay. We are just about out of time. We have time for one quick question. If anybody's got anything, type it in the uh, Q and a, but um, uh, so I had forgotten, it's been so long. I had forgotten this was part two of, of the, I was like, oh, I was disconnected on that. So, That's okay. so, so if you missed part one, I would invite you to go back to, it's posted on our website. You can find all of those uh, uh, webinars on there and lots of other good things too. Um, uh, Eddie Caparucci and Drew Boa did a great one. It was an hour and 25 minutes on Wednesday you know, where they role played. And I thought, wow, what a great visual for, you know, for navigating things, you know, uh, it, rather than just, you know, listening, they, they role played and Drew did a great job of being a betrayed partner. So, um, so I'd invite you to check some of those things out, but lots of resources for you here. Um, if you're in Arizona, reach out to Debbie. If you're looking for a therapist, they do great work. Um, I do refer regularly to them. So that's, that's an option, but she's licensed in Arizona. So, um, but otherwise I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank Sounds you so wonderful. much. Bye everybody. Have a great weekend. Bye. See you.